Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, I hope this is going to be a productive meeting. We've got quite a lot of important business to transact, and it could ask you to observe the usual, uh, the usual rules of WebEx etiquette, please, um, so we can get through the business efficiently and effectively. Andrew, uh, do we have, first of all, any apologies? Yes, Kavina. Um, one apology from Councillor Branham McBay, who's been substituted by Councillor Jones today. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Um, any declarations of interest? I've received notice from Councillors Watson and Cameron that they wish to declare an interest, so I'll let them um, explain that, their declarations. I see Councillor Damasco wants to make a comment. Thank you. Just to add apologies for... Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Right, um, good afternoon again. Uh, right, I want to now proceed uh, with item two. Can Convener, I ask... Councillor, uh, Councillor Kelly's uh, made a point of order. Councillor Kelly. Thanks, thanks Convener. It's just to, uh, to declare an interest in item two. I'm a substitute member of the the city deal, um, but it doesn't uh, stop me from taking part. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm in the same boat as well, Paul. I'm in the same boat as well. Um, any other? Are we ready to transact the business? Can I ask Kate to lead on item two, please? Good afternoon. Thanks, convener. Item two is the six monthly city deal programme update and outlines current progress on all strands of the deal but also seeks approval um, within this paper to progress procurement activity for two of our infrastructure sub-projects. If I can pull attention to section 2.1, I am happy to note progress that's now been made at Motherwell train station with Balfour BT able to commence um, works for the station in, in June this year. And as of Monday, they were able to progress phase two of their work programme, which sees kind of more visible presence of, of the construction activity they're going to do in the main station building and on platforms two and three. In order for the Council to progress our um, city deal element for Muir Street for that project, um, we're seeking committee approval to utilise a third party framework, the SCAPE framework. Um, that usage will be subject to a feasibility review as outlined in section 2.1.7. Moving on um, to section 2.2 .2 of the report and our progress with respect to the East Airdrie Link Road sub project. Despite the obviously challenging conditions um, as a result of the pandemic, we've still been able to work on the option development stage, that kind of crucial stage for this sub-project, um, and trying to identify a preferred route for the road, which we hope will be finalised by the end of this year, and we'll be carrying out even more stakeholder and community consultation um, as, as part of that. Um, but you'll see at section 2.2.2, a next pre key procurement stage, and as outlined in recommendation three, is to progress with site investigation works, and, that, and that's something that, that we're voting for committee today. Also, um, under recommendation four, we're seeking approval to recommence the procurement of professional services works um, for East Airdrie um, Link Road. Lastly, just to be touching a kind of positive note as well for, for the City Deal Programme update. Um, we, we managed to successfully pass our first gateway review, our first five-year gateway review. Um, there was notification of that from both UK and Scottish Government in May. Um, that, that gateway approval um, releases a further £250 million of capital funding for the deal to take us up to 2025. And that recommendation is asked for noting at number five. Happy to take any further questions in relation to that report. Well, does anybody have any comments or observations? Councillor Gallagher, I saw you intimated you want to make a point. Uh, as I say, the stage is yours. Thanks, Convener. <laughs> Thank um, it's on 2.1, particularly 2.1.2. I mean, I'm delighted to see that the works have started at Motherwell train station. Um, I, I think, you know, all uh, Motherwell councillors will be delighted to see improvements made in this area. Um, and I just hope they go smoothly and without any hitches. Um, but that's what my question sort of surrounds. It's mostly um, can councillors be kept up to date every couple of weeks on the stages? Um, so it's going to take 16 months to complete, so it would be useful for councillors, particularly local councillors, to be kept up to date on that progress. And obviously, we are living in uncertain times just now, particularly with coronavirus. So if there is a material change, for example, you know, we, we go into a local lockdown situation, um, can councillors be informed of when works are stopping? And it's just so we can have that dialogue and communication with local residents and constituents. Um, that's all, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. That's a fair point. Uh, Kate, can we deliver on that? Okay. Absolutely. 
Absolutely, um, definitely. The officers are, are very involved. We've, we've got a joint communications group between ourselves and Scott Rail and the contractor, and we can relay that information through you. So we'll maybe, as you've maybe said, either a two weekly or three weekly kind of all relevant um, councillor update is, is absolutely something to do. And I think we've tried to do that through our comms. I think this week we, we did a bit of an update to, to let the wider community know um, that the more visible works were happening as well in the station. Because today in June it, it was the stuff the car park ends with the projects that. Is now becoming more visible and, and more important. You're kept in the loop. Thank you, Kate. Um, any colleagues, uh, any other comments or observations? We have the looking to come in. On you go. Hi there, thanks. Um, uh, my apologies because I, 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 I but I, I, I missed the end of what was said because I was distracted. Uh, Councillor Beard's having difficulty logging on. Uh -huh. I don't know if any, uh -huh. of the, any of the officers on the call are in a position to assist Councillor Beard, but uh, if anybody is, then that would be great. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of the Murrable project, fantastic that that's uh, moved, well, basically now in progress. Uh, great news. In terms of the East Airdrie Link Road, um, obviously, there's a there's a concern there, and that it's it's the, the 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 stage of the project that we're discussing uh, is already twenty percent ahead of budget. Uh, it would seem that we are are we being asked to approve that extra one million pounds today? I believe in twenty seventeen that was approved to the value of four million. Uh, it's just seeking clarification whether we are being asked to approve that additional million pounds today. Um, a little bit more clarification on on why we're a million pounds over at, at that stage of of the project, uh -huh. and where that million pounds, where we're going to melt, find that million pounds. Whether it, it's hoped that we, you know, it, we still over in terms of the overall budget, uh, we, we can recoup that, or whether. We're going to have to seek extra funding from the council and uh, from city deal, etc. Um, in terms of the consultation for for the link road, understandably we entered into the uh, current situation we're in, I guess, in terms of COVID nineteen. Um, the consultation was just the information was posted on the council website. Understand the next stage would the intention would be to have a public consultation in October. Which again may or may not be able to happen. Uh, so just seeking a little bit of clarification on what the intention would be at this stage. If we can have a, a physical public consultation on that, and if not, what the intention would be at this stage in terms of any online would it be would there be webinar in online webinars for local residents or would it just be something would it just just be an intention to post something on the website again? Right, Paul. Thank you, uh, Kate. Are you in a position to respond to any of these comments or now? Hi. Yes, Camina. Um, on the first aspect, um, with in, in respect to the professional services um, contract, um, the value of that uh, we, we, we anticipate may need to expand up to five million pounds. However, until it's subject to that procurement, we will have to come back to this this committee actually to let you know the outcome of that. Um, we, we won't know the final the, the final the, the final price um, at the moment. The cost of that can still be met within the within the project budget, and the rationale for this just being the extent of of some of the works that have just discovered the length of time that the project's going on, inflation, indexation, and things like that. So, if anything, we're, we're, I think that it's a bit of a crystal, not a crystal ball, but I suppose we're covering ourselves that we think the five million would be the absolute maximum based on sort of tender returns that we've had for professional services and that sort of um, that kind of lack of work at the moment. But until we've actually tendered those works, we won't be able to come back with a finalised figure. However, we are comfortable that it can be met within that kind of current city deal um, and project budget. On the second aspect, if Councillor Damasio, if that's okay to move on to that, definitely the consultation for um, for East Stage Link Road. We were really disappointed. It was the week of lockdown, and we had um, everything organised, all of the boards. It was, it was really disappointing what happened. But going forward for stage two, we would have the web presence, but we're also um, speaking with the consultants to do is try 
webinar or type virtual consultation room type approaches we need to be innovative we also might need to be a bit more sort of desk based or, or, or issuing more things through the mail for those people that don't engage through virtual um, platforms we're also hoping to try and, and, and capitalize on the development of the community boards that are now creating as well and the time scale for that so we're looking at all of those opportunities um, and all of this, I think, just to reiterate, is pre-planning for East Airdrie Link Road. Um, and certainly, that's some of the feedback we've had from the community. This is all in advance of all of the pre-application planning consultation that we'll do with the residents and businesses and media. And that'll be a further opportunity for them to kind of voice their views. Okay. Paul, does that answer your point? It does, yes. Can I just say, uh, uh, like I said at the start of my comments, I was distracted. Uh, did, did you did I miss mention of uh, the Eurocentral and Medicity? Was there, have you covered that? <laughs> My apologies. No, it's not. In, it's not in this. It's in the next topic, I would think. Next item. It's in this paper, yeah. Right, Paul. If there's any other points, just come come back to me direct or go to Kate direct and copy me in. I'd be grateful, and we'll get you in. Uh -huh. Sorry, I think Kate's trying to answer Councillor Damasco's point. Right, thank you, Olivia. Kate? Sorry, sorry, Convener, um, and Councillor Damasco, happy to, to, to give you a call afterwards. But yeah, I didn't want to cover everything in the report today, but so I didn't I didn't actually talk through the Eurocentral um, or the Medicity updates, but both are in progress, both um, particularly with respect to Medicity, I think, I think we can see there that all the, the targets have been largely overachieved. Um, I think the, the biggest, my, my verbal update was really around the recommendations today. So you didn't, you didn't miss anything in that respect. You could ask. Uh -huh. uh, on Eurocentral, how, how the, the and it's great news that we're looking at the low carbon hub. Uh, you know, um, there's just the. Get an idea from officers how confident we are of getting the extra funding for that. And second, on the Medicity project, to understand the funding was from 2015 to 2020. So is that coming to a conclusion in terms of our, our assistance there and, and how to anticipate that project going forward? Is it basically going to be able to stand on its own two feet going forward? Thanks, Councillor Damasio. On the Eurocentral Park and Ride element, we think adding this sort of the, the exploring the EV and the solar canopies and aspects to that further expands that project and, and, and makes it more um, likely to attract um, external funding. We haven't, and it's, a, it's still at an early stage, so we haven't um, sought any applications for funding yet, but we think by revising the scope and making it more than just a park and ride and share in that location, that, 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 that you know, amending that scope makes it more um, available available for funding opportunities and we'll report back as and when it gets to a point when we can make those funding applications. But certainly the, the direction of all sort of external funding at the moment is on that sort of low carbon agenda and we feel that it would be a miss to not try and, and look at that for that area. Um, with respect, respect to the Medicity grant, you're correct. So the performance targets here show performance to quarter 18. Um, that lasts up to quarter, um, quarter 20 will be the last sort of um, area of performance for Medicity. Um, and, and yes, the, the, the business plan for this was, was that there would be no additional public sector funding into the project um, and that the business would be able, the Medicity entity as itself would be, would be able to, to, to be sustainable. Um, and we think from the progress that's been made and success that's been made, especially because Medicity, I suppose, was all its time. It was, a, it was a virtual business entity, and in the current environment, um, you know, it, it's, it's got a successful platform to work forward to. So we don't envisage that there'll be, nor nor do we have funding um, for additional funding for the Medicity project. That's not to say that we wouldn't be able to support it in other ways. Um, and I'm sure of Owen um, Weir, who's the enterprise manager, will be able to kind of add any anything else on that aspect, <laughs> either during committee or after. Paul, does that answer your points? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, there's a commentary, Paul, on page 11 of the report, which summarises all the key statistics very well. However, if you have any additional requirements, please get in touch and we will address them. Councillor McPake, I believe you want to answer something. Councillor Convener, Convener Councillor Lennon was in first. Right, my apologies, Councillor Lennon. We 
no doubt agree that this is a pretty positive report coming forward today, and I'm sure that that agreement is well placed. However, it's just a point of clarity I'm seeking, Chair, under 2.5, 2.51, in relation to the labour market and innovation strand update. Perhaps Kate could indulge me. The, the numbers and the figures in relation to registrations and volunteering, considering the fact that that was in August 19 to July 2020, and given the fact of the COVID pandemic, which is understandable that numbers would be low, but overall, these figures look extremely low. But obviously, again, looking at it from a volunteering perspective, we'll have three volunteers here with an actual zero figure. And then we look at the other aspects of that, and the figures are quite considerably low, especially considering that it's about trying to get people back into mainstream employment. Okay, can you comment on that? Yes, of course. Thanks, Professor Lennon. And I might draw upon um, one of my fellow manager, Paul Kane, on this respect. We are aware that working matters has been a success with respect to uh, getting ex offenders into employment. I think that it's been less of a success with the job affairs, as you can see in that table, um, steering them towards the volunteering and vocational um, certification. I think um, it's, it's working matters that delivers this project, and I think. I think it is a success in its own right that they've prioritised employment potentially before the vocational aspect side of things. Um, but it's something that we've still got um, some work. There's still a, 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 about a month or so left of the programme, and that was something that Roots, and work, Roots to Work were trying to focus on so that we achieved um, all of the targets across the board. Greg, does that answer your point? Just a quick supplementary here. Here we have an actual figure of 65 registrations and job starts. Nine. Again, it's it's quite a low number. So it's obviously again, if I was one of these individuals participating in that, I would want a positive destination. I think. I'm just curious as to what figures we are. Well, Greg, I'm going to ask Paul. Paul, can you come in? Can you... Yes. Um. Thanks, uh, convener. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I suppose Working Matters itself was a really successful programme that was working with people with long-term health issues. There was a wee bit of money left over at the end, and we decided to try and work with uh, ex-offenders. So it was a bit of a try and see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> the COVID-19 will be used as a, the excuse for many, many things in the future, I imagine. But uh, as you can see, it was supposed to run up until July 2020. That final three months would have been the time when you'd have been putting people into college or a uh, went to courses or finalising certification. So uh, it is uh, the the job outcome figures they met their they, they exceeded their target and they kept kept those quite low. I can, I can feed back to Roots to Work on your disappointment about the other targets not being met and get some feedback from them and get in touch with you, councillor, because I know they're still working on it. Uh, th there was a hiatus during lockdown, but they've picked they've picked it back up again. If that's okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Right, Greg. Okay, thank you, um, Michael. I thanks, think Chair. Come now. Yeah, Michael. thanks, Chair. Um, it's actually just a comment rather than a question, and it relates back to Councillor Damasio's question around about the every East Link Road. If you go to page six and one point two, there, there's a table, and it shows you one of the only uh, one of the first um, endeavours. Was the Gap Course Glenboy Link Road? Now it's got an indicative figure there of six point two million. The actual price when that was all complete was somewhere around four million. So on all these projects, we're going to have to have swings and roundabouts. There will be gains in some and losses in others. So just to give everybody a bit of comfort, uh, you know the actual figures will maybe come in under, and they might be slightly lower. But I think in the whole balance of things, it'll be able to balance itself out. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if any project of this nature and complexity in its entirety, you're going to have a uh, wins and losses, and, uh, and our staff are managing the project efficiently. Now, are we happy to accept the recommendations, colleagues, and proceed? Convener, Harry has a declaration of interest. Harry, noted. Uh, sorry, Convener. Uh... I should have declared an interest in the last the last item that we're finishing. I didn't think I think it was just a matter of uh, it was factual rather than any debate on it. I've got a declaration of interest in the last two items concerning routes to work, being the routes to work. Noted, noted, Harry, noted. Right, we happy to proceed, colleagues. Yes. Right, can Agreed. we move on to item three? 
Kate. Thanks, Convener. I'm actually just to assist with this item, I'm going to try and share a, 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 some slides to be able to see them in a minute. Trust everybody can see these. Um, the item, item three is one of our outline business cases. It's one of our biggest um, outline business cases that we've had to, to submit um, or, or, or hoping to submit subject to approval today um, for, for, the, for the City Deal Infrastructure Programme. And I think it's, it's of such a scale and it's sort of, we felt it was kind of worth merit and, and to support the report to provide some slides on that. Um, so really just this is the sort of presentation that subject to approval today, um, officers will also have to provide to the Glasgow City Region Chief Executives Group and to the Cabinet. So I suppose this is a, is a bit of a precursor um, pending approval today of this outline business case. I think it's useful um, as a reminder um, when we were talking about Ravens Craig to, to, to remember that the current master plan approval that was granted in June. 2019 now um, about everything that's kind of shown here is all the all the potential that Ravens Craig has um, and, 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 and we as a committee are, are more aware of that than any um, that, that it has and all of the economic development potential that it has for North Lanarkshire and the Glasgow City region and that's really underpinning this outline business case it's, it's the reason we, we managed to have a programme realignment um, a few years back and it's, it's something that we continue to kind of reiterate, reiterate. I think some of the kind of elements here, and I hope you can see my cursor, but you'll see all of the opportunity that can be developed here from either the residential development, some of the employment and commercial uses, and we've got some of the projects that are live on site just now, such as Ravens Creek Park. I think given the scale of the site, it's easy to kind of get lost or, or to think that the infrastructure in Ravens Creek is delivered. That's not the case, and the infrastructure that we want to deliver through this project provides that secondary southern access into the site, along with improved access to the north of the site. It's of such a scale, it's really hard to show, and, and, and that's a, a, one of the precursors to this slide, but it's really just to show that by opening up this new southern access, at the moment, everything has to come through as we go through the college, but there will be, um, subject to approval of, of this project, the new southern access that will an, an order this huge amount of development potential across this 1,100-acre site uh, to be secured in the future. So really, that was, I just wanted to have a, have a reminder for, for the, this is the basis of the outline business case and everything that we're trying to secure. I think we're all aware um, of the legacy that, that, that Ravens Creek has, has left us. It's almost 30 years since its closure. But some of this sort of excellent work that's already happened in the first phase of the development of the site, and, and that's summarised from some of the images. The council's been the lead um, funder for a lot of it, for all of this activity, along with Ravens Creek Limited. And it's really just in order to make sure that progresses and some of the current development activity that we have just now. We need to make sure that the, the strategic infrastructure to the site is secured. At the moment, as, you, as I've mentioned, we've got the seven hectare park, which we're hoping um, to, to be opening in um, early 2021. We've got continued significant housing um, development interest in the site. Things are all positive um, for Ravens Craig at, at the moment, and we want to um, build the infrastructure to make sure that, that that momentum keeps going. And it's not for the next five years, it's for the next 20 years. And that's what this infrastructure will allow to happen. The basis of the business case today is, is the road infrastructure to the site. And as, as I mentioned, the scale, it's quite difficult to, to be able to try and show in one slide, but that's a, a big summary. The Ravens Craig Infrastructure Access Project is everything outlined here in the, in, the, in the cerise pink. From the north of the site, we have Ravens Craig Infrastructure Access North, which is the dueling of the existing A723. We've got the Ravens Craig site here and picking up on the, the previous phase one road investment. We want to build that secondary um, crucial southern access to the site, which is Ravens Craig, um, Ravens Craig Infrastructure Access South. And as you'll see, that aptly kind of ensures that the site, which is, has national um, planning significance, has excellent access to both the M74 and to the M8 in the north, and all of that um, investment has happened previously. Uh, these um, are images that I actually appended to the committee report. Um, I just wanted to put them up again just to be able to talk through them and maybe to refer back to any of the questions that we might have from committee members. But these are breakdown images um, of what the Ravens Craig Infrastructure North is to begin with. 
Um, and it, it shows you it, the Ravenscrieg Infrastructure North project follows pretty much the alignment of the existing A723. So if I can just pinpoint here, so this is the, the top of the Ravenscrieg site in, site up here, and it will follow, it will dual the existing alignment. It will make expansion to existing roundabouts, such as here and here, and follow the existing alignment. What I'd also like to point out here is that the, the roads will separate, and this makes um, use of existing NLC investment in the A723 bridge um, that, that was placed back in 2015 now, I think it was finalised. Um, so previously, the council invested £6 million. We had an opportunity through Network Rail to take forward this Ravens Craig Infrastructure North project in the future, and, and, and that connects that area there is then us realising that through the dual carriageway. If I can move on, we move up, um, we're still heading northwards up to Chapel Hall, and you can see the dual carriageway rejoins here with improvements to Lonehead Road roundabout, carrying on. Then moving up, we go through, as we continue up along, heading towards Holytown, we're going to be replacing the like the like Granite and Burn footbridge as well, improving access to that side of the area. And then this is where the, the Ravens Creek Infrastructure Access North project finishes. We're heading up, as you, as you know, towards Holytown. We're making the most of the gyratory investment that already happened by the private housing sector development at the crematorium. We're going up to the very busy A775 junction at Holytown, expanding the capacity of that roundabout, and then reaching dual carriageway all the way up to what I think is known locally as the Honeywell roundabout at the southern end of Chapel Hall. I appreciate that's a, a total whistle stop tour, but it's everything that's in the sort of slides, and that's the RIA North aspect to this project. If I can move on to RIA South, and just starting at the bottom here, we've got um, a, the roundabout that exists at the moment at uh, the Ravens Craig Sports Facility. But what we want to do is build a whole new dual carriageway arm coming from that roundabout, opening in, and this, this, this creates that southern arm that I was trying to show in the, the first master plan slide. This image is continued here, and at the moment, apologies for the convener in this image, but it takes us on to we're going to also develop along this dual carriageway a new roundabout, which opens up employment access land at the back of the college, and then takes us to this significant investment as, as part of this overall project, which is the West Coast Mainline Crossing. And an image of that is, is demonstrated here. This is, I think, an element of the project that's been discussed before at committee, but I suppose seeing its position within the overall RIA South um, structure of things maybe helps. That crossing again is here, and again we have dual carriageway right up into the Windmill Hill, Windmill Hill roundabout, which will, as you see, the current roundabout and uh, the, um, the council buildings and chamber would be here. You can see that. Uh, vastly significant expanded Windmill Hill roundabout to allow this um, new road infrastructure to take place. Aside from that, there will also be improvements and finalisation of the duelling um, along Airbus Road and up to the sort of junction as you come off the M74 here. So these are all the images that are on um, within the committee papers, but it was just to, to re-emphasise um, and be able to talk through them. A big part of the OBC is about what the economic case is. That, that is the, the biggest reason as to why the city deal will fund or not. As you know, it's an economically driven fund. And as part of that, we've had to undertake quite a lot of detailed economic appraisal work, which is shown and, and summarised there in terms of the huge potential in terms of realisation for city deal, what delivering this road and what the following development can, can have. Some of the numbers here are, will, will greatly support um, future gateway approvals um, for the city deal. And some of the job figures here, as you can see, are, are, are make it a really strong case for this project. So that's also um, a, a kind of a summary, but fair to say we're, we're confident that this is really excellent levels of economic potential that can be released from this investment. We've also got summarised what the kind of cost of development for RIA, and for RIA overall, both north and south are. So that's now standing at 127 million. Um, and, and how at the moment, what proportion of that would have to be funded from the council and what's currently available in the current city deal um, allocation. Obviously, we as a council will continue um, to pursue um, if there's any underspends within city deal to make sure that, that, that we can capitalise um, on the city deal investment to that project and try and bring down where possible or through other external funding the, the necessary council contributions to the project. 
At the bottom there, we're just summarising what additional funding we would actually be requiring as part of this OBC approval from the Glasgow City Region, what, um, what the next stage of funding ask would be. And that would be £7 million of which the Council would be required to fund. It's always 14% of the city deal cost that the Council would be required to fund just under £1 million. Lastly, um, just to touch again, and this is within the report, on what we propose in order to sort of manage the financial risk to the Council, what the phasing for RIA, I think it's very obvious from this presentation, it's a project of scale, um, and how we pr propose to come forward um, with future future business cases, final business cases. So we would be splitting the project up, um, starting with the West Coast Mainline Crossing, because we have an opportunity to work with Network Rail in a, in a closure period to take that forward. Obviously, we need the, the rail crossing to happen before um, we can then move on to the new dual carriageway um, within the, the southern end of the site. We would then move on to trying to deliver the, the, the dueling um, through Ravens Craig Infrastructure North. And then lastly, um, it would be the, the, the duelling of vehicles. And this ties in with what the transport appraisal requires and necessitates um, for the future development of the Ravens Craig Master Plan. So, subject to approval today, we would be hoping to um, be allowed to submit this um, business case to the City Deal PMO and for that to be considered by the September uh, Chief Executives meeting and then hopefully progress um, to the October Cabinet. We would also be subject to future um, pre-application consultation um, this, this year too. I'm just going to end the presentation now, but I'm happy to take any questions. And I can also say that the Senior Project Manager, um, A. Johnson Smith, for this project is also on the call if there's any particular questions um, in relation to this project. I'm going to open it up to questions, obviously, but I understand there's a number of questions in the pipeline. And I understand the first one is from Colin, the Councillor Cameron. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the first opportunity we've had to actually see a detailed route map to this. And I had a question regarding the, it's in Appendix 2, Orbison to Motherwell. It's the actually the new One Mill Hill Street roundabout. I'll, the question I had was regarding the 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 site that's more towards the Ravenscraig. It seems fairly close to an existing um, listed building that has already subsided. I was just wondering if there's any scope in the actual design plan, if we discovered that there was a continuing issue, to move the road slightly further away from the building or whatever during the works, given that. Uh, that section looks like it will be done to, between either between two uh, A and three, by the by the looks of the actual listing of when works will be done, and all the approach seems that all the approaches will have been worked on by then. It was just to find out if we had any room to manoeuvre there if if necessary. Kate, are you in a position to respond? Right, because it's possible to bring in Jonathan Speed, who's closer to this element of the project, please, at the time, so try and answer that question. Yes, child, sure. please. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the time. Um, I'm assuming you mean the um, South DL uh, building immediately off the roundabout, sort of on the northeast corner of the existing yeah, roundabout? That's correct. Yeah. Um, at the moment, our road alignment has worked, obviously, to stay outside of the footbridge of the building and of the grounds of the old churchyard itself. We are relatively constrained at the moment in moving further south in that we're trying to avoid taking out um, existing operating commercial premises. I mean, there might be a little bit of room for manoeuvre. Um, it would need a bit more negotiation around the runner shops that contains, uh, I think it's Greg's and Tesco's and I think Capizza Hut as well, just, just, just around the edge of that. I mean, there may be some flexibility in, in shifting it a number of metres. I don't think we can come particularly very far without coming into larger acquisitions and, and taking out more, uh, more businesses. Um, something we have been keen to do, because obviously the Ravens Craig site itself was around opening up development and, and uh, economic activity. Something we are keen to try and do is to try and minimise the amount of businesses that we obviously disrupt during the project itself and so we found hopefully at, at the moment we found a corridor that we think is relative well that is as small as it can be obviously given that we are putting a dual carriageway through a number of existing businesses um and the shift certainly going from a road over railbridge as was a couple of years ago to going underneath the railway line has significantly lessened 
uh, that footprint in no longer needing large embankments and significant structures. But there are some pinch points. So we will certainly, obviously, as we do more surveys, and once we get a bit post planning, sort of in this around this time next year, we will, we uh, we can do some more site specific investigations around particular buildings and look at that in more detail. Certainly, and uh, there is some scope, but not not masses. But it is obviously something that we'll need to bear in mind as we get closer to construction. Certainly, yeah. Colin, are you happy with that response? Uh, yes, thank you. I was just slightly concerned about us opening ourselves up to possible legal ramification of uh, the new sure. damaged uh, listed building. Thank you. Uh, no, no. Right. Thank you. Certainly. Hope you've got the uh, assurance that you're looking for. Can I ask uh, Councillor Kelly to come in now, please? Thank, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that, man. And I just it's more of a comment. I just think when you, when you look at the stage we're at today, that we're about to hopefully get the approval for outline business case. It's a real historic moment. Um, I mean, Kate's going over the numbers. It's it's unbelievable the job numbers and opportunities. It's something that we, the administration, committed to driving forward very early on. It has taken time, but I think we have to put it in perspective. You know, this is the largest city deal I think across the whole of Scotland that's got to this stage. And this is probably the largest investment that will be seen at this scale that we've ever had in our history. And um, it's thanks to all the work yourself, the convener, vice convener, and all the staff that have taken us here this day. I know publicly there's a great desire to see Ravens Craig moved on. It sometimes feels like the pace is slow, but in order to achieve such an outcome we're looking at today with you know hundreds of millions of pounds of investment, thousands of jobs coming in the next 20 years, it takes a lot of time to get there. But what we see today is we're now in the path that's moving quick. We've got the dates for the contractors going out there on site. And very quickly, we'll start to see that progress alongside, as Kate said, all the other work that's already on site. So I think it's a really historic day for North Lanarkshire, for the administration, as we take this forward. One question I do have is, obviously, everything that's happened with COVID, we've been in a period of, of, of lockdown, etc. I'm assuming it hasn't really impacted on this work because we aren't actually on site. So there shouldn't be significant delays. Hopefully, if we can get the if we can keep on this time scale, we should be able to achieve what's outlined in the paper. Thank you for your comments, uh, Paul. And noted, uh, Kate. Can you respond to the last point? Yeah, yeah. Certainly, Councillor Kelly. Um, yeah, the, because of the stage of the project, we haven't had to. There hasn't been significant. There's been some delays to being able to carry out some survey work, um, but it's not been critical to the overall program. Unfortunately, there was some delays to the Ravenscraig Park, which we now have to. It would have been opened um, just now, um, and it had, did have to, to be delayed, and it's not going to be formally opening till next spring. So that maybe was one of the kind of biggest Ravenscraig casualties of, of, of COVID. I think it's still it's still good that the, the contractors for the park are, are, are back on site, and that's back. Thank you. Um, Megan, I understand you want to come in with a point. Thanks, convener. Um, I mean, plans, I mean, the, the plans look good, but I don't think you actually know the extent of the, the impact it'll have on local communities until you actually ask them the question. And I see that community uh, consultation will happen in the autumn, but my concern is that dialogue's not happened up until this point. Um, and there's various different um, housing estates that will be severely impacted by this, particularly in my ward as you head up towards Raven uh, Ravens Craig. And my question really is in relation to new builds, um, you know, in relation to people that have moved into the area, they probably don't know the history of the drilling of this road, which has been historical. It's been discussed in years going back. So what can as the housing development have they been involved drilling? Because I'm a little bit concerned here that we're approving something that the community might not actually want. Kate, can you respond? Yes, um, it's just an update um, the committee on that. So with respect to the, the existing, the current, the current um, the plans that we have just now, we've actually lettered um, over kind of 500 affected, particularly more towards the Airbus Green Acres Road, Green Acres Estate, sorry, um, end of, of Motherwell, just to make them aware, along with the commercial businesses in Orbison Street, because we didn't want something going out, as you know, the, these papers go out on Mars, so we wanted the, the, the businesses and the residents to be to be informed, um, so we've done all that pre-planning, um, pre, pre and as you quite rightly say, we will in the future be doing um, pre-application in consultation um, in the autumn, in subject to this approval and, and, and to cabinet approval. With respect to new builds and, and, and development going forward, um, I think for the existing, very much, it's, it's Taylor Wimpy and, and Barrett that are on site just now, and, and I think Barrett are a subsidiary of, of, of Wilson Bowden, who are, who are Ravens Creek Limited, 
they are very aware of the, um, of, of the plans and, and the constant needs for this road infrastructure. In terms of future development, um, the master plan will accommodate now up to 4,500 homes. But the, those homes, and I, I don't know the trigger point figure, Jonathan would be able to, to, to let me know, but um, they, they won't happen without this road infrastructure going forward. And I think that it's just it's trying to trying to evidence that you know that the, the housing development will stall at, at what it is just now because there isn't the capacity um, in the southern aspects of the road to take it forward. So I think the housing developers will be very welcoming of, of the fact that this infrastructure investment is happening and it allows um, the development to, to keep continuing. Megan, does that give you some reassurance? It, it does to an extent, but my concern is, I mean, the 500 homes that were surveyed are, are lettered within the Green Acres Orbison area. I mean, there's no reference to this in the papers itself that that was ever done. Um, and I'd be interested now to hear, you know, what the, the responses were, if the council did receive any responses, were they positive, were they not positive? Because, again, this sort of opinion and this feedback for councillors will actually shape how we move forward, if we move forward with this plan today. Right, point noted. Uh, Kate, can you... Is there any? Did any? Yeah, I did. Yeah, the paper that has, has been limited, but can I, I think Jonathan again can, can provide a, a more detailed update for Councillor Okay. Hi. Um, so, in terms of the businesses around the Orbison and Rose Street area, first of all, we'll take those ones. Um, I guess over the last six months, we've been doing a lot of um, environmental and ecological services around the area so we can develop our designs. Um, and we've had a fair bit of contact with both businesses and landowners as well as tenants of the properties. And in general terms, I think it's fair to say that what they've wanted from their point of view is just to know certainty as to whether they're inside or outside of the road corridor. I think the earlier planning commission in principle from 2018 had quite a wide corridor sort of of a, a larger landscape going, going through that part of Motherwell. And I've been quite mindful, I guess, in looking after the project of not wanting to tell people prior to this point that their buildings are in or outside of the road, because almost inevitably I would get it the wrong way around if we said it too early. So what we made the commitment to those businesses and landowners particularly to do is that as soon as we had a more settled set of concept plans that worked in transport terms, that we spent a lot of time working with the councils, environmental assets teams to come to that point, that as soon as we had that view that we would then uh, we share those publicly with, with with those owners and occupiers and also give a much better idea of time frame on that side so, so we've endeavored to do that with the business owners and with the tenants and generally i'd say the response has been i'm mean, generally fairly open and honest i think an archive which has been keen to be as honest as we can when we do know things and when we don't know things but from their part they've been understanding and more recently one or two are certainly happy that they now fall outside of the corridors and as it will mean it's sort of no immediate impact on the business I mean, there will be disruption during construction, but it ultimately means that there are more buildings on Orbison Street and Rose Street that can remain in occupation and can remain there in perpetuity. Um, and in general, some things uh, the businesses have engaged well, and I would say um, in good spirit, if you like. I think some of them are obviously concerned around timing and of what happens, and particularly some of the landlords of tenancy properties are just wanting to know what happens if a tenancy comes up in, say, a year's time. Do they re let or do we not? Our intention on the land immediately by the railway line is that subject to city deal cabinet approval October, we will start to negotiate with the landowners and tenants in that area I mean, to, to try and acquire the land by private negotiation rather than resorting to a CPO later on. So how that will that will hopefully start and they're aware of that timing. And I think a lot of them have just been keen to know that something is moving on Raven's Creek, I guess, after quite a period of time. Um, for the properties in the more residential area around the western end of Airwells Road, at Green Acres and so on. Um, in terms of historically from the housing developers, I think the main one or two that we've been dealing with around Bellway, Barrett's and also Springfield properties have been quite aware of the developments because it comes up in their planning searches, certainly because the road had an existing outline consent, I think, from some time ago, and which that has been being picked up. I guess over the last year or so, as we've been doing topographical surveys, we've had contact with a number of the residents that have moved into the Springfield properties site off, off, off Tinker's Lane. And again, for their part, it's more been around understanding the design and the concept and where we get to that point. And so again, we've been keen to share that as soon as we've been ready to share something that we believe we can actually construct. Um, and likewise with Green Acres and the surrounding area. To date, uh, since those letters went out last week, I've had six responses really just asking for copies of the plans. We sent them initially a letter that just, just, just kind of introduced the stage of where we're at and sent them links to the website. But we are aware that we have a number of households, particularly in 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 certain parts of the world that don't have great internet access and don't have live screens and so we have been sending out some hard copies of the plans in a bit more detail so so far i've had six requests for those and those have now gone out this week i mean for hard copies and so far the comments have been just we'd like to see some plans and it, and it's been good natured so we'll kind of see what comes out i guess over the next sort of few months 
as Kate said, we will be doing more formal structured pre-application consultation in the autumn this year once we get to City Deal Cabinet. And I think in conversation with both the Council's comms team and with the planning team, we're still working out the best way to do that in the current working situation with the virtual and physical and just, and just trying to make sure that, that, uh, that we do get a broad enough catchment area and for those with or without access to IT. So we're still trying to work out the best way to do that. I guess there's lessons to learn from the East Energy Project on how that went or whether we didn't well, uh, go well in certain parts. So, Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Megan? You happy? Um, can we have not too comfortable with this, to be perfectly honest with you, because I feel as though we're only finding out now um, that people have been consulted today and there has been responses today. I think councillors really should have seen these responses which circulated within the paper. Um, I mean, uh, to approve the report in principle today um, would obviously be good for the area and the plans look good on paper, but I am very, very concerned that you know, there could be res local residents, local businesses that will be impacted by that. They have not had time to properly digest these plans, and we are railroaded something through without actually getting full community backing. I'm just a little bit concerned about how this process has been carried out, to be honest with you. OK, well, your, your points are noted, and we're obviously where we can improve the dialogue, that will be done. And if you've got, I'll ensure that you get additional information. And if you want to have a, a dialogue right later with myself, that's fine. And we can take it forward. Okay. Can, convener with that, can I just absolutely confirm that if it's approved in principle today, that plans can be changed if the community are not in agreement? All, all of the road plans are still obviously subject to planning consent. I mean, we don't have the detailed planning mission I mean, for any of the southern infrastructure. So we still have to go through all of that statutory public and other statutory stakeholder consultation. So we don't. Um, I'm assuming if this is approved and we go through cabinet in October, we still have to get the detailed planning permission to construct. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, there is still a much more formal public consultation to be done. Absolutely. Thank you. That, that actually, I, would, I would hope that would give you sufficient assurances now, because there's enough checks and balances in the planning system. I would think to address those points. Um, can I, I can I ask uh, Jim Hume to come in now, please? And thank you for your patience. Thank, thanks, Chair. A couple of requests, please. Um, the, the, the roundabout beside the Civic, the new road, uh, it looks to me like um, it's taking out the garage and, and a detached building there. Um, I, I'd, I'd, need, I'd need to see, uh, if I'm reading the plan correctly, which maybe I'm not, but I'd need to see more detail on that. That seems quite significant um, uh, impact on, on commercial areas. Um, who, who could give me more detail on that? Kate, you will respond. Uh, uh, Chair, Chair I, I don't need to just now. Um, you know that, that if 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 someone can can speak to me offline, I'd be happy with that. Right, I'll give you that assurance. That will be done, Jim. You had another point, oh, I believe. Yes, um, the on page thirty, um, I'm 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 really surprised. Um, I think the the left in left out situation should be a last resort in roads, and I noticed the three here, and I can't imagine the people in Green Acres not objecting strongly to these proposals. Um, based on that, if you imagine coming out of Green Acres and having to turn left, it takes you down to a, a very, very busy set of traffic lights. And most people that come out of Green Acres are want to turn right to go up to Motherwell. And, and I need to understand <clears throat> the logic behind that uh, as well and, and why people thought that was appropriate. So I don't know who, who I can speak to about that or who will get back to me on that. But um, people from Green Acres will, will object to this based on that. I'm absolutely sure of that. I'll get somebody to respond to you offline if you're comfortable with that, Jim. Yeah, that'd be fine. I'd okay, imagine Megan good. would be interested in that as well. Right, thank you. Can I ask uh, Councillor Baird to come in now, please, David? David, are you still with us? Hey. Oh. Hey. Hello, David. Hi there, thanks, Kimpy. We are receiving hey. you. <laughs> Uh, sorry, see and hear me now? I can, David, all too clear. It, uh, it's particular uh, to the area uh, at the Holytown roundabout. Uh, from the, the map, I can see there's got to be uh, what looks like significant earthworks uh, both to the north and west side of uh, Edinburgh Road. Uh, this would have an impact in the, the Holytown Memorial Gardens. Uh, 
I haven't seen anything uh, within uh, the report that uh, sort of gives an idea of what's going to be happening there. Will this have an impact on the the war memorial, etc.? And you know, are we looking at relocation or you know uh, what? What impact will that have? Because that will be a concern uh, to the residents of Holytown who have sort of been making uh, comments and representations over the the, the 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 state of the memorial gardens at the moment. Kate, are you in a position to respond, David, or do you want a response offline, David? Uh, no, respond online. Uh, right. Okay, Kate, know. if you can, please. Yeah. Can you know, yeah, and I can ask for Jonathan for more detail, but anything that we do would be some, obviously it would have to be sympathetic to the existing War Memorial facility and, and indeed try and maybe improve the kind of connections there because as I, I live nearby and I appreciate it sort of on the side of the road and not being well integrated with the Transport Scotland investment in the road as well. I don't know if Jonathan had anything specific I can add to that particular area of the site. Uh, sure, the, I'm a... Uh, the plans at the moment are to show some earthworks along the eastern side of the memorial gardens. Uh, the war memorial itself isn't affected by the works and can remain in place. The, the parts that we still need to try and work through within sort of that that part of the scheme, particularly, are around the drainage. Uh, we are aware at the moment that the um, war memorial garden suffers uh, uh, are quite are quite frequently from flooding um, issues, and we are still working on some of the drainage strategy for that part of the site. So. We don't envisage at the moment that the the, the um, war memorial itself will need to be moved, and we have made a provision within the project budget so to work with community groups to look at how we reshape the gardens and reprovide the gardens around that eastern edge of the war memorial itself. Okay. But that will be subject to more detailed consultation with the community um, uh, boards uh, later in the process, we would hope. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, David, does that answer your points? Uh, one further. A, a supplementary, if you don't mind. I, I will. On you go. As, I'll indulge you, David. On you go. Uh, at that area, uh, as you can see, the sight lines, the road sight lines, uh, are very poor for uh, the residents who are trying to cross the road at the moment. Uh, when the carriageway is being constructed, uh, you're looking at removing uh, some of the overhanging trees that will improve the sight lines. And, uh, and there's there, uh, going to be some kind of a uh, crossing uh, uh, put in uh, uh, or near there, which will allow movement, not you know, east and west across the roundabout. Kate, are you in a position right. to get off any comment? Okay. Jonathan's best to, to answer, if that's okay. In terms of the sight lines around the roundabout, absolutely. I mean, we are aware, obviously, increasing size and also speed of roundabouts. We need to make sure that there are that there is a decent bit of visibility around the corners. Uh, the detail of the landscape scheme, which is still being worked up in part, to, to uh, look at sort of um, it isn't a lot of trees overall, but there may be some trees being moved and some trees being replaced, but also cut back to make sure that we get the visibility, visibility for safety lines. I mean, safety is is paramount throughout this process. We are looking um, in terms of crossing points, which is your second point. Um, it, it's, it's intended at the moment that a, a pedestrian crossing occurs on the um, southern arm, sorry, of the roundabout, just getting my compass the right way around, <laughs> on the southern arm of the roundabout to be able to cross from west to east across there. Um, I think the detail of positioning of that is still to be uh, clarified once we get a little bit further into the project with the contractor, but at the moment it is intended to be on the southern um, as that's the slower approach to the road, people coming off uh, for the north, and that we we think that there's issues with speed and safety, and with the drop in the hill, it's safer to be on the southern sound side rather. Okay, thanks. Thank yeah. you, Johnson. Thank you, David. Um, Paul, I believe you had a comment to make. Hi there. Uh, first, I'd like to by councillor. Gallagher's input in our calls in terms of the consultation, uh, and I, I take the, you know, I know the officer's assurances made today uh, at, at this committee in terms of the consultation process going forward. Um, also, just want to refer back to I, I take on board uh, Councillor McPake and the convener's comments earlier in real relation to the budget, and we we are likely to have potential fluctuations from one project to another. 
Uh, but I, I don't think as councillors, uh, looking at the public purse, when we're talking about hundreds of millions of pounds here, that we should be discouraged from asking these questions. So I think it's important that we do. Um, I, I would like to sleep, seek a little bit of clarification on this project. My understanding, looking at the previous paper, is that the project was initially, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I think it was expected to be about 101 million. Uh, and in this paper, it, it's 127 million. There's no, if you're just looking at this uh, paper on its own, there's no mention of that fact. So, I mean, I think it should be made very clear under 2.1, uh, sorry, 2.11, that that is an increase of £26 million. That should be made abundantly clear. We're talking about a you know, huge amount of public funds there, um, you know, in case anybody misses that fact. Uh, and I would obviously like to ask a similar question as, as before in terms of, you know, what the reasons are for that £26 million fluctuation. And just going back again to fluctuations between various projects, if a project is either above or under, in terms of the 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 funding process, if we are under with the, the Gap Cosh project, for example, as we mentioned earlier, do we lose the funding that we didn't have we didn't use there? Or does that go into the wider pot for these other projects or have we lost it? You know? And likewise, obviously if we're over elsewhere. Thanks. Right. Paul, thank you. But can, can I just first say, uh, any committee that I chair, anybody knows any meeting I chaired uh, in Nisarida or, or elsewhere, I always allow uh, ample time to discuss things. I always allow, allow ample time for scrutiny. And uh, I'm sure the comments weren't directed at anybody in general. But they will, you could ask what you like, Paul. That will always be the case when I'm chairing things. And Kate, can you comment on any yes. of the points? Thanks, Councillor Damasio. I think uh, you're right. To, you're right to note the change, and I think I think we've tried to cover that kind of change in the rationale for the change in costs in Section 2.8 of the report. I think it's right. It's a fundamental point to raise at committee about um, the, the fact that the costs have changed, um, and and that been, there's a number of factors as to why that's happened. I think when we first came up at strategic business case level with the 101 million assumed figure, that was pre any development work, pre site investigation, pre you know, and and and, and I think. Some of the factors are summarised there, and if you need more information on that, happy to provide that after committee. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of time. With regards to the city deal and movement in that as well, yes, there is some flexibility. It's not that the, the funding is lost per se to North Lanarkshire. Um, we do have to present a case for that to city deal cabinet, um, but it's, it's, it's not that the funding would be lost necessarily. And in fact, North Lanarkshire would be seeking because of our IAM because we're actually putting more than a 14% contribution if. And in, in the case where there's maybe other councils where there was underspend, we would actually be seeking to try and get additional city deal funding. And we think this OBC is is our strongest ability to do that because of the economic potential it can it can deliver for the for the region. And um, so just and, and again happy to discuss offline uh, about the funding side of things. Paul, you happy with that? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Greg, you've got a point. Hmm? Convener, Councillor Rorty wanted to first. Right, my apologies. Councillor Rorty. Thanks, Convener. Um, I've just come back to the comments that Jim and Megan have um, raised regarding the concerns at Greenacres. Now, all I would say is there's been a lot of advertising and there's been a lot of dialogue regarding the city deal over the last minimum of three years. This project this is something in a project that has been spoken about long before then. I think it's a phenomenal addition um, for North Lanarkshire and all the surrounding communities. And I would also say, being somebody that's in the construction industry and had worked um, on the Taylor Wimpy development at Ravens Craig, the initial development, um, when the houses were sold to the clients, it was always on the assumption of the infrastructure that would follow. That is where the excitement came from people to invest within this area. Now, the, o the only um, disappointment there's ever been was the Park and Ride um, railway station um, 
that fell to the side because a lot of people had invested only solely for that, thinking that it was a perfect uh, commuting location for them. But I, I mean, I just think this this is fantastic. Um, and really, I, I understand people have got concerns. I wouldn't want people to put an absolute doubt on this and think this wasn't something that we could take forward and look back in 20 years' time and say, what a phenomenal um, structure investment and road investment that came to North Lanarkshire. It was only really a comment I wanted to make. Thanks. Thank you. Your comments are noted. Uh, Olivia, do you want to expand on anything? You said. Olivia, do you want to expand on anything? No. Right, thank you. Uh, Greg? Greg, could you speak up, please? I'm speaking up, Chair. <laughs> I feel like I'm on a ceiling snake. Can you hear me, Chair? You're sort of coming through. Sort of. Sort of. I can hear bits of your commentary. You can hear bits of my new chair. I'll try bringing it closer then, like my grandmother. Can right, you you're doing well. Right, there we go. Chair, given the good faith that Councillor Gallagher has presented their comments there and also Councillor Damasio, and in the good faith that it was presented, could Councillor Carson perhaps clarify her comments in the chat bar? Because obviously that's a wee bit contrary to what's just been presented. Yeah, I was trying to talk to Andrew Rose and I accidentally done it to everyone. Thanks. Just making sure the good faith was upheld there, Chair. Thank you. I'm sure it was, but my colleague and your good self. Colleagues, I'm anxious to, to move on in business. So obviously, we've got quite a few items other to transact. And uh, I think the subject's been given a, a good airing, a good examination. Are we happy to accept uh, the, the recommendations? Right, thank Great. you. Great. Great, thank you. Great. Can we move on to item Great. four, Pam? Thanks, Convener, uh, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, this report the, on the uh, economic recovery plan is really is, um, two uh, purposes of the report. The, the first is really to um, update the, the committee on the, the council's response uh, during lockdown and, and to date uh, to try and mitigate some of the worst impacts of the, the, the economic uh, effects uh, that, that coronavirus has had and, and the support that the, the council and its partners have been able to give uh, to businesses to support the local economy. But really, the main the main purpose of the report is to um, advise committee that work is now underway in terms of developing our economic recovery plan to look to make sure um, that we're doing everything that we can, both the council uh, and its partners, um, to make sure that um, we support the local economy um, to uh, not just to, to recover uh, from the the obvious impacts economic impact of coronavirus, but to continue to grow. Obviously, North Lanarkshire, um, as you can see from all of just about all of the reports from today, um, you know, was in a very strong uh, economic position prior uh, to uh, the pandemic, and we, we clearly want to make sure um, that we recover that strong position and we build on our many strengths. So, really, um, I wasn't intending to to go through the uh, the report in any detail today. I maybe just uh, highlight a couple of the the main sections or go through the main sections of the report um, that I'm sure everybody's had the opportunity to read. So, uh, uh, without going into um, obviously detail, because the, the, the picture is changing on a daily basis, clearly there's been uh, severe um, economic impacts already in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the impact of lockdown. And indeed, um, even since the uh, writing the report, we've now had the, the July um, fig claimant figures, and, and the, 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 the picture you know is, is continuing to uh, to get worse. So, current um, Payment rate for North Lanarkshire um, as of with the July figures is at 7.2 per cent in terms of the, the working age population um, uh, in receipt of um, employment related benefits. And I suppose what is of particular note and concern um, is that the, the figure uh, for young people is 9.7 per cent. So clearly, um, you know, in terms of all of the activity that, that, that we want to, to focus on going forward, um, is, is you know, one of the main areas is to make sure uh, that we lessen that impact um, and support young people um, who have been um, uh, most severely affected um, by the, the economic impacts. So, uh, moving on from that, um, uh, in terms of Section 2.1 of the report, 
And again, without going into a lot of detail, um, but I think maybe just to, to sort of, uh, acknowledge and put on record, uh, you know, the fantastic work that has been going on um, across the council and indeed with with partners uh, to the immediate response um, that we were able to put in place to, to do everything that we could to support um, the local economy and to support local businesses. Um, and the detail of that is, is obviously within the report, um, and it included uh, a very quick um, response in terms of being able to um, deliver uh, over £41 million of, of grant support to um, about 3,800 3, businesses uh, through the, the Scottish Government's um, uh, the, uh, recovery fund um, to make sure that we, we were supporting as many local businesses as, as we could within the criteria that, that was set out by the, the Scottish Government. So um, a, a, a huge amount of work uh, has been involved in that. But um, really the, the, uh, what I wanted to focus on was really moving forward um, and, and what we do from now on in terms of uh, what the next steps are in terms of um, supporting uh, economic recovery. And Section 2.2 of the, of the report goes into that in, uh, in more detail. Uh, I think we, this is probably a trailer for a number of the other reports that, that, that the, the committee today, all of which uh, feed into and support um, the, the economic recovery for, for our area. I have said as well, and, and um, we, we've reported to committee before in terms of the uh, ec economic regeneration delivery plan, um, which will be a key factor. Uh, that was only very recently approved uh, and remains absolutely critical. Uh, in terms of um, how we uh, can support uh, economic recovery. That's very much focused on um, some of the infrastructure projects that we've already been talking about, our new supply programme um, that, that people uh, that's still on track and still um, still being delivered. And indeed, we're looking at you know, how we can accelerate the, the house building programme and support private sector housing activity as well. Um, and also looking at how we can uh, better improve and support our um, our industrial business and industrial offer. North Lanarkshire is in a strong position, and obviously the economy uh, and the nature of the economy is going to change, and, and probably going to change uh, for good in a lot of areas with people moving uh, in terms of how they do their shopping and online. Uh, and North Lanarkshire is, as we know, very well placed uh, in terms of some of the the, um, the facilities that um, companies will be looking for, distribution, uh, logistics type uh, facilities, in, in North Lanarkshire, hopefully. Um, with um, the support from the council and others, we will be in a good position uh, to attract new uh, investment as well as uh, retain existing uh, in, in, uh, investment and businesses who want to expand their existing operations. So um, a lot of work's going on uh, at the, in the background, and there's more detail in other uh, reports to this committee about some of that that activity. So really. Uh, building on on a number of the strengths, it's certainly not all uh, all doom and gloom, um, and I think we're within a within in, in a lot of ways uh, within a strong uh, strong position. So the areas that we're uh, the economic recovery plan will will particularly focus on is looking at um, you know further developing and enhancing and targeting uh, the support that's available for business. And as the report outlines, um, we do already have a strong business um, business support offer. Uh, um, and Yvonne's going to touch in a minute in, in terms of um, some of the additional supports that we intend to, to put in place or we want to put in place uh, to further support our local um, uh, businesses. So there's there's more um, uh, options and more work that we're going to be progressing there. As I've just mentioned, we want to um, you know continue to improve our industrial offering. And again, there was quite a lot of activity that already going on. Um, and again, we'll touch on that in some of the other reports in terms of the uh, the, the support that we're putting in place, both in, in Ravenscraig, in terms of opening up um, more employment land there, uh, some of the vacant and derelict land fund um, money, and how that supports the development of our uh, business um, and industrial offering as well. So again, it's about um, refocusing some of that efforts and looking at what more we can do. We also, and I think this is absolutely critical, um, the council is a major, a major investor in, in North Lanarkshire in terms of our um, capital programme, not just some of the programmes that, that Kate and, and Jonathan have been talking about, but uh, the wider council ambition programme um, in terms of council investment and indeed our, our day to day spend. Um, and we want to continue to look at all options that, that, that we can um, to make sure as much of that spend uh, stays in North Lanarkshire in terms of opportunities for, for local people and local uh, supply chain. Um, so, again, uh, you know, that's something that we, we want to, to continue to focus on. And, 
Danny Vaughan will pick up, pick up on that uh, in a later report around the supplier development uh, programme. And, and obviously underpinning uh, all of this, uh, you know, it's, it's not just about what, what we can invest in and, and, and the, the, the physical um, structures and physical investment, but very no point in doing all of that if, if we don't have the right um, skills uh, and, and we don't have uh, our, our young people uh, and our existing um, workforce uh, aren't properly skilled uh, and able to take up uh, any employment opportunities that, that are created. So again, Paul probably touched on some of this um, in his uh, reports, but um, we've, we've got a strategy in place, again, that was approved literally a couple of days before lockdown about developing our workforce, um, not just the Council's workforce, obviously, but developing the, the workforce in North Lanarkshire. Um, and, and lots of lots of good work that's going on, and, and but clearly um, plenty of, of scope uh, for, for further work and further improvements and linkages with the schools and colleges and so on. So. Um, that, that's a, a very whistle stop tour, I think, of um, you know what what was done, what's been done to date uh, in terms of our response, but more importantly, um, the activity that, that's progressing to develop an economic recovery plan that will be aligned with our economic regeneration delivery plan that was already in place, and that will be bringing the economic recovery plan um, and, and more detail um, around some of the, the areas that are covered in the report today. We'll be bringing that back to a future committee. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Um, well, thank you very much for that a comprehensive update, by that, Pamela. Uh, colleagues, I understand there's a number you want to ask some questions. I, I'll start with Paul. Paul. Paul, your mic's on. Hi there. Okay. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank, uh, on behalf of uh, all councillors, I'm sure, and the SNP group in particular. Uh, the officers for their hard work uh, in recent months, uh, including the business support officers uh, and staff who have been action, actioning and processing the Scottish Government grants, which, as we all know, were in the tens of millions of pounds, as was referred to, uh, which, which has obviously helped keep our economy growing, businesses up and running, and people in, in employment. Um, not um not not to mention that you know the pressure that the the we are under uh, in terms of time scale to, to get those through I, I've no doubt whatsoever uh, and I thank them for that um also wanted to I thank them uh, you know for for all their work um since then I guess in, in, in helping businesses open start to open back up as well and I'm sure that's that's ongoing as we speak. And their their uh, help me expertise, I'm sure, is, is much valued uh, by business owners. Um, in terms of the economic delivery plan uh, due to the COVID outbreak, uh, look, I'd seek a confirmation, and I assume uh, well, I'd, I'd seek assurance actually. First of all, <laughs> excuse me, on the timescale. So, is it will it come back again to the, the next committee that report? Uh, and secondly, I'd just like to ask, will the creation of that report and feedback and development um, be also go through the COVID-19 members officers working group, which Council approved uh, two weeks ago? Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Councillor Damasio, and, and um, uh, uh, thank you for uh, that, that acknowledgement of the, the work of the team, Yvonne, uh, I'm sure will... Um, feed that back because um, it, it, it wasn't easy, as you said, and, and uh, particularly listening to uh, as the team did in terms of some really difficult um, experiences that, that businesses were going through, and, and uh, you know very hard times for a lot of people. Um, in terms of the the time scale for uh, bringing back the, the economic um, uh, recovery plan, um, I'm I'm not going to commit to next uh, cycle because I think um, you know a lot of these areas. Uh, will need a, a bit, bit more development. From the, off the top of my head, um, I think we had uh, scheduled for a cycle one of um, you know the, the next year to bring back the update of the, the ERDP, because um, again it was recognised that the, there was a need to review the, act, the actions uh, within that, uh, and um, I think uh, that it's more likely that that would be the better timescale uh, for, for bringing both of those, you know, to make sure that they're absolutely aligned. 
Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not familiar with the 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 the, the sort of remit for the the member officer uh, group that you're referring to, but I'm, I'm I would imagine that, that that this would be an obvious uh, report that um, that that it could go to that group, and I'm sure, I don't think there would be an issue with that, but. Um, I'm, I'm no doubt we'll get more detail of that in, in due course. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Pam. I uh, could ask okay, Tracy. Tracy, you want to make a comment? I believe contribution. Yeah, actually, it was with regards to the Scottish government's um, self-employed hardship fund that was introduced due to the, the amount of people that um, weren't included in the, the UK assistance that was provided. But I found the answer, so thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Tracy. Paul, Paul Kelly. Thanks, Kavina. Um, it's just to again to echo the comments. I, mean, I think we're all really grateful to, to the Council and all officers here today for all the work that went on to, to sort of um, process and implement what were very good schemes from both UK and Scottish governments to provide support during that the period we've gone through. In this paper, and we touch on all the excellent work we've done as a council, I think we've been a very, very innovative council prior to COVID-19. We had the fastest growing economy. We were very business focused. We were looking at new employment, new opportunities. We're seen independently as being one of the best councils for coming out of it in terms of opportunities because of the nature and skills of our workforce and the things that come in the future. However, I do have serious concerns. Given our page 35, you know, you can see some of the, and 34, you can see some of the figures that have been being used right now in terms of what the furlough scheme has been done what's coming around the corner. And today, the Institute for Public Policy Research is predicting that by the end of this year, youth unemployment will be 140,000 um, for, for Scotland. And I do think we have to be concerned as, as a council, because although we are doing an excellent job, we're doing excellent work, the furlough scheme ends in October, the, the business grants and support is ending, and we need we need more from both the UK and Scottish governments. They need to be as innovative as we have been as a local authority in the work we've done to bring investment opportunity to North Lanarkshire. What you saw in post-war Britain after the war, you know, a government that was thinking out of the box and being innovative and parking aside a lot of the politics of the time. We need that desperately from both the Scottish UK governments, because as much as I want to be positive, and I think North Lanarkshire is in a unique position, different from a lot of other areas, these figures are actually terrifying. These are real people that are potentially going to lose their jobs. And we've already seen the impact of long-term unemployment on areas like North Lanarkshire where the industry went. These are, this is a time where the, we need to see more from both the UK and Scottish governments. We need to see something that's out of the box in terms of what comes after the furlough scheme, what comes in terms of protecting businesses. Because if we don't see that, then these figures are going to be proved to be correct. And that would be a real scandal, I have to say, Kevin. You know. Thank you, Paul. I think it's right to acknowledge the contribution from both uh, governments, London and Edinburgh. Uh, London has put significant sums of money into the Scottish government. Um, uh, via the Barnet Consequentials. I think we've got to acknowledge that, to be fair and to be right and proper. And we are being innovative. We are thinking out of the box, as you'll see when we can uh, further down the line with additional reports here. Um, is anybody get any other further comments? Are we ha happy to accept notes? Yes? Thank you. Can I move on to item five, please? Vaughan, I believe that's you're just going to say a, a brief point. Uh, thank you, convener, and good afternoon, everyone. And I'll certainly pass on um, the thanks from members to to the teams and also to Paul Doherty's team and the non-domestic rates team. Um, the, advan the Advancing Manufacturing Challenge Fund. Um, we previously reported um, the submission of the application to committee. So, again, positive news to report that um, our bid with New College Lanarkshire for two hundred and ninety thousand pounds of um, European Regional Development Fund money um, was awarded through the Scottish Government's Advanced Manufacturing Challenge Fund. So we now have the funding to create a North Lanarkshire Manufacturing Innovation Hub based at New College Lanarkshire. Um, so section 2.4 of that report highlights the key aspects of the hub and also the state of the art robotics equipment that we're looking to procure as part of that. Um, I'd highlight certainly that we're looking to support at least 173 SMEs. And on a very positive note, we're planning very close links with the schools to enable school visits um, linked to STEM activity within education. Thank you. Thank you, Avon. Any comments, MD? Paul? Paul Damasco? I would, I would just like to say briefly, uh, I very much welcome welcome this project and uh, once again the, 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 the funding from the Scottish Government uh, and look forward to seeing positive outcomes in North Lanarkshire in terms of uh, assisting businesses and uh, employment, especially with, with young people. 
So, no, welcome. Very welcome. Thank you. We're happy to move on, colleagues. Thank you. Item six. Convener, I'm just going to place Councillor Cameron into the virtual lobby as he declares an interest in this item. Please do. Okay, that's that done, Convener. Item six. Uh, thank you, Convener. So this report um, is seeking approval to use um, available council funding and funding that we plan to withdraw from Business Loan Scotland to establish a coronavirus business recovery fund to support um, local, small and medium sized enterprises. So the purposes of the fund are really to enable businesses to restart, adapt and recover from the impact of coronavirus. Um, you'll see from the report, and Pam's already highlighted um, the funding that the council has been able to administer on behalf of the Scottish government and UK government, and also um, to signpost businesses to Scottish enterprise and other funds that have been available. However, not all businesses have been able to be supported through these funds, unfortunately. Um, as you can see in sections 2.2 and 2.3 of the report, um, we've had a significant number of business inquiries received by the team, which the team's been working through. And we recently conducted a survey of 814, bus well, 814 businesses responded to our survey, which was around 10% of the business base. And notably, um, many of the concerns raised in the survey were funding related um, with businesses reporting very, very low cash reserves in the very immediate future. So we're looking at creating two funds with the limited resource we've got. And um, we think um, we will be able through discussions that we're having with the Scottish Government to maximise any European regional development fund funding that we can to augment the 1.5 million that we will have from previous legacy funds withdrawn from the West of Scotland Loan Fund and the funds will withdraw from Business Loan Scotland. So we're proposing section 2.4 um, to create a back to business grant um, or with a fund of 200,000. Um, that would be small grants of two and a half thousand for businesses with two to 20 employees that haven't received support from elsewhere. And that's really to enable them to do a range of projects such as e-commerce platforms, income diversification, adaptation of business models um, to help them move forward. With the, the remainder of the funds, the 1.3 million plus any European regional development fund we can get, we're proposing a COVID recovery grant. This will be a longer term fund to support strategic and longer term survivability and growth of businesses. Our aim is to get the Back to Business Fund launched as soon as possible and take time to develop the recovery fund. What we're very keen to do is avoid duplication with any national funds that may still come out. We've got very limited funds as a council that we can put towards this, so we want to make sure we're focusing on any gaps. Um, and the recommendations are all detailed in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Excellent summary. And uh, look, th this is all positive news that's in here. However, before I pass uh, additional commentary, I'll, Paul, uh, Marcio, I understand you want in, Paul. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I just want to, uh, you know, again, uh, thank the officers for the work on this. It's a great initiative. Uh, to lay, um, back the, the, the initiative in terms of uh, moving this fund from, from elsewhere to, to so support local businesses in this way. So, yeah, I'm uh, very, very pleased to see this paper today uh, and, and in support of our local business. Thanks. That, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, I've been in a dialogue with the team for a, 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 some time about this and we're anxious to get this off the, the drawing board and into reality, and that's what we're going to do. I mean, obviously, we've got lots of challenges ahead, but we go forward in a positive way and we can do this. We can definitely do this. Any other comments, colleagues? If, if you want to move on to item seven. Fine. Can we move on to item seven, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, this report is really for noting um, to make sure members of the committee are aware of the good work undertaken by the Supplier Development Programme. The Council, along with um, all 31 other local authorities in Scotland, plus a range of other agencies, um, make a contribution to this um, programme every year. Um, 
the purpose of the programme is really to enable more SMEs to gain understanding of opportunities for public sector procurement and enable them to increase their skills and capability to access that funding. So that's delivered through a range of activities um, from information on the website, from webinars and events and so forth that are all detailed in the report. Um, I would highlight section 2.2. There's been strong work done by the council um, to maximise opportunities for SMEs locally and we're certainly keen to expand that further. And also within the report, it talks about some of the good work we've done recently with our education colleagues around supporting um, childcare organisations and also taxi and bus operators. Um, so happy to take any questions on the report, but certainly one of the asks I would have is, you know, if you are engaged with any SMEs, signpost them to this. It is an excellent initiative and the more businesses we can have benefiting from public procurement, the better. Thank you. Thank you, Vaughan, for the excellent summary. Any comments, colleagues? Anybody, any comments? You'd be happy to accept? Right, thank you. Thank you for your approval. Can Sorry, convener, Councillor Humes, come in. Jim? I, I was in before you closed, Alan, so... Um, uh, it's okay, it, Jim, no problem. No problem yeah, whatsoever. Yeah, there's, there's, there's lot, lot, lots of um, items on the agenda um, telling us about support that's available for businesses. Um, and frankly, frankly, it's too much to, 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 to understand. And, and, and one sitting, um, but I suppose the general question would be: if I ran, if I ran an SME, mm -hmm. and had aspects of difficult difficulty and whatever, um, is is it easy to contact the council to be to be directed to to all of these different initiatives that that are that are there to support and and help businesses at this time? Is it, is I mean, all, all all the stuff's there. Is it easy for businesses to engage with it? That's what my question is. Well, from my, my, from my experience as a convener, Jim, I would say yes, but I'll let Yvonne expand upon that. Uh, thank you, convener. Yes, um, what we have done is we've set up um, an email portal to take inquiries, so business support at northland.gov.uk. We've recently been working with colleagues in corporate communications um, to really signpost people to the council's website where we do have information on the support available. As a council, um, we've been producing a daily update on all the support that's available from the UK government, Scottish government and um, other agencies. Um, that's actually now been rolled out across Scotland. So Although we are producing that, um, other agencies are now using that, and that's um, updated on a daily basis and should be coming out in the member inquiries, the links to that. So that's on the Council's website. We've also been working closely with Business Gateway, and our Business Gateway service has quickly amended and looked at its services to ensure they're providing um, recovery and sustainability support to businesses. But most importantly, you know, we've been working across council sections as well. So I've been working closely with trading standards, environmental health, non-domestic rates and other services to make sure we've got a joined up approach. And what we've now got on the council's website is um, easy to access information for businesses looking to reopen. So we're doing as much as we can to get out there and certainly um, there's more campaigns to come on social media. Sounds good. Thank you, sounds sure? good. Thanks, Chair. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Can I move on to item eight, colleagues? Yes. Convener, I'm going to move, move Councillor Watson to the virtual lobby as he's declared an interest. Right, okay. Okay, that's done. Thank you. Item eight, please. Uh, thanks, convener. So, uh, so this report um, is just to update the the committee in terms of the vacant and derelict land fund, um, and the, the the committee will be aware that the the council's allocation um, for the current year was um, uh, just under two million pound. Uh, as and as in previous years, the council then uh, submits a delivery uh, plan to the Scottish government outline uh, how that funding is intended to be used uh, within the criteria uh, obviously of the uh, of the fund uh, and how it can be used um, and it's just to update the committee that um, the delivery plan has now been approved by the Scottish Government so that it's intended to, to use the funding as set out in uh, Appendix 1 of the report and that obviously also includes um, as we referenced earlier uh, funding to support the uh, um, opening up of the, the employment land uh, within Ravenscraig, so obviously very much uh, uh, within the, the overall um, sort of theme of today around Ravenscraig and also the, um, how we can support uh, economic recovery by developing more opportunities um, for investment. So 
Uh, that, that's a, a, an important uh, one of the important projects, along with, um, as, um, as you can see, other uh, uh, funding for um, that will put through fusion assets in terms of development of the, the Gartcos um, a, a business area as well. Um, the other part of the report is, again, just to update the committee. Um, we also uh, annually bid for funding that's available through the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund. Um, and uh, this fund, again, supports uh, infrastructure um, projects and commun community projects. Um, and we, we uh, have had some quite a, a lot of success in that in the past. It's a two-stage process, so um, the projects that, that were submitted um, for the first, for stage one, uh, are outlined in Appendix 2, uh, and we're seeking um, committee approval. Um, once we know the outcome of uh, of these, of stage one, which I think is expected sometime in September, um, we're seeking approval to then uh, follow on um, with the submission uh, for stage two for any of the projects that, that are successful. Maybe just by way of clarification and just a, a correction that, that um, came to my attention just before committee in terms of the, the Spring Hill um, Community Hub, where we're saying that um, it's proposed the, the proposal involves demolition of Spring Hill Community Hall. Um, the proposal is now actually um, not demolition and new build, but re refurbishment and extension. Um, so just a, a point of correction in terms of that, that appendix. So um, we'll obviously update a uh, committee in terms of the, the outcome um, of these uh, submissions uh, and uh, the, the outcome of this, the stage two submissions. Happy to answer any, any further questions. Hey, thank you, Pam. Any questions, comments, colleagues? Happy to accept. Thank you. Moving on to item nine and 10, but nine first, obviously. Paul, I believe that'll be you, Paul Kane. Yes, as convener, thanks. Uh, Hello again, everyone. Uh, so, this report is just to flag up to committee at an early stage that this is a UK government fund which is going to be channeled through the Department of Working Pensions. It's a significant amount of funding, seven point five billion pounds, that they plan to spend over the next five years. It was planned pre-COVID, so uh, it isn't in response to COVID. But uh, the report describes the actions we've taken so far, along with routes to work to ensure that if there is an opportunity to get involved, then we we we, we can explore that potential. Basically, uh, one contractor is going to be assigned to Scotland. That will be some, probably a multinational organisation that will win that contract. And we've been in dialogue with all the ones that we think may win that contract to ensure that we can be part of the supply chain if and when they, uh, they win the contract and deliver in North Lanarkshire rather than someone else delivering, a private company or whatever. Uh, we expect to hear in October which contractor or contractors have won won that, and uh, then report back to committee on how that progresses. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Any comments, observations, colleagues? Happy to accept everything. Yes. Moving on. Paul, again, item ten, please. Okay. Thanks, convener. This is the report that a. Uh, Councillor Rorty will be very familiar with because it used to go to the ALIO and External Funding or External Organisations Committee, and it, it now goes to the parent committee, which is Enterprise and Growth. And uh, it describes the performance of Roots to Work, one of the council's ALIOs, over the last 18 months. Uh, it gives some background, it provides some highlights, and uh, the comp contributions they've made to the wider council agenda, as well as some internal achievements that they, they wanted to highlight. The key part of the report is the list of programmes that Roots to Work have been involved in delivering and how how they've got on in uh, achieving their targets uh, across that range of programmes. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments, colleagues, observations? Happy to accept the note the recommendations, yes? Yes. Okay. Can I wish you all a good day? Mm. I hope you found it productive and useful. We are in a dark valley at the moment, but we mm. shall get out of it. Trust me. The only I think it was President Roosevelt that said that the only thing we have to do is fear itself. This can be done. We can do this. We will get out of it. Thank you, everyone. Both well, thanks, thanks, Chair. Thanks, thanks Alan. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.